So Jay Nandez, a YouTuber and life motivational speaker for PLO Mastermind course. He likes to fly to Vegas to play the Aria PLO games. So imagine my surprise when I see him sitting alone at 1020 PLO on WSOP.com on a Thursday no less when the games are usually good on the strip. I've never played him heads up and I know how lonely it can be sitting alone at a table. So I decide to sit with him and give him some action. Literally firsthand, we sit down and it's a banger. It goes raise, three bet, call. And on this flop, we're all in firsthand and we need to fade a bunch of hearts while he needs to basically fade a couple of sixes. Thank God. That could have gone terribly. Also, check out who made out better in the end. I actually played Jane Nandez three days in a row online due to a combination of boredom, curiosity, and I just like battling heads up. Aside from that first hand, nothing too interesting happens. I start off playing standard and eventually switch to my patented limp heavy style to see how he reacts. Heads up is really interesting since there are so many styles at play. When I play heads up, I think of it like developing a relationship with the other person and it's always interesting to see how our personalities come out during the match and evolve over time. For this first session, I felt like both me and Nandez played fairly tight, although he started off firing some bluffs early on. I'll show a few highlight hands from the session. So this first hand I limp, he raises, I call, and flop 3 pair. He c-bets a large sizing and I raise. Term brings a queen and I barrel and he shoves. Uh, here I'm not beating any value and all his bluffs are going to be semi bluffs like ace, king, king, jack with spades or something like that. So I think I have a pretty easy fold. So next hand I open, get 3 bet and it checks down to the river where he just turns air into a bluff without any club blockers. This next hand I start with my limping strategy and he raises and I call and we hit a set. He checks, I bet about a third and he calls. And on the turn, I obviously worry about the jack-10 as there's no flush draws on the flop and I block a 6-7-8 rep. Uh, so I check back for pot control and he goes and pots river. But we're pretty high up on our range and despite no blockers, we're going to call and get some information. And he ends up having a pure bluff. Anyways, I'm not going to go through all the hands in the session as it wasn't super interesting. I think me and Nandez were both just trying to feel each other out, see if we could detect any leaks or holes in the other games, and just gain information from there. Uh, pretty shortly afterwards, another guy sat down, which kind of ruined our heads-up match, and I didn't really want to play three-handed, so I left. Um, but there was one more hand that I found a little interesting before that happened. So at this point in the match, I'd been limping quite a bit, and he noticed this and started to raise out of the big blind a lot. I'm not sure if that's good or bad. I do recall that this was the first time he used a pot sizing for c-betting, and of course on this flop, I have a flush draw and open ender, so I call. Turn, he used a half pot sizing, which I found a little weird because the board is so dynamic. So if you do have a straight here, you probably want to go large or pot. And finally on the river, the front door flush comes in, and he decides to turn his hand into a bluff. And I think this was a first hand that I felt like I strongly disagreed with his play. Considering that he blocks top two pair on the flop, and he blocks the back door club draw. And also factoring in that I did not raise when the straights came in. Uh, my most likely holding in this spot is just going to be a lot of hearts. So I think this spot is not a spot I would ever turn a naked queen of hearts into a bluff. He just ends up blocking everything else that I could have. Anyways, I end up leaving the session once the third player joins because I was really looking forward to a heads up match. Um, I booked a small win, but I did come back later when Nandez was sitting alone again for session number two. Session number two, the first interesting hand of note is this hand where I call a raise and I flop the nut straight with a fake nut flush draw blocker. 
uh, Nanda's bets, and I decide to flat here because I'd like to leverage my Queen of Spades uh, in the future if the Spades come in and possibly bluff him off a chop. Uh, the turn bricks and he pots, and with these SPRs, I decide to just rip it in. And this hand's a little significant because as soon as Nanda sees this play out, he should realize that I do have flatted nuts on my flop range. So he's got to start proceeding more cautiously on turns, uh, given that I am going to the turn uncapped uh, in some spots. So yeah, this line is pretty good for protecting your check call range going to the turns. Um, you should have some nuts and not always check raise. Uh, we play a pretty big hand shortly after. This is not that interesting. He actually decided to 5-bet uh, get it in with double-suited kings, which uh, he probably doesn't know this, but it's not a very good strategy against me in particular since I play a pretty nitty preflop game with a lot of limps and very low-frequency 3-betting. So if I 3-bet, I'm going to have a much tighter range than the average heads-up player. Uh, this next hand, I decide to play around with different sizings. I decide to see how he reacts to a min-raise. On the flop, we flop a wrap and we c-bet and we get check-raised. Now, this is, I recall, one of the first times he check-raised me. So, of course, with this hand, we're never going away. So I'm a little curious to see what he has here. Uh, turn queen and it brings us a flush draw and a queen so we're definitely not going away he pots and we have a pretty easy call finally on the river a flush comes in and he bets half pot and since we backdoored the flush we're never gonna fold uh, also in heads up generally you don't fold flushes um, so we call and we actually see a really interesting combination of cards for him to check raise pot turn He's got a 4 and a 7 for a little bit of board interaction and backdoor diamonds. And then on the turn, he picks up another gutter, but I probably wouldn't pot this um, given that I didn't turn that much equity. Um, it's possible that he just wanted to check raise me because he found my flop small c-bet strategy kind of annoying and just wanted to put me to the test. And I'm also just not sure what a solver would do in terms of check raising combos here. And as far as the river bluff goes, that's probably okay, but I would probably prefer a block bet small sizing or a larger sizing. Uh, for me personally, I find the half pot sizing to be sort of half-assed in general. But it's heads up, and I actually don't think there's really a right or wrong in heads up. I think everyone can just do sort of whatever they want. He gets me in a couple big hands. Um, for this hand, I flat the nuts on the turn. I felt like he might have a decent amount of bluffs here that he would barrel with. And on the spade river, given that I have nine of spades, I felt a little obligated to call. And unfortunately, I do run into a spade with a straight blocker. Uh, the next hand, I noticed he also went pot on the flop. And the last time he did that, he had top two pair. Normal sizing is like three quarters, so he might actually have some sizing imbalances. But it's still too early to tell. Um, in hindsight, knowing what I know now, I probably think the river is a uh, fold. Even if we do think his flop strategy has a lot of top two pairs with a pot sizing, I don't think those ever go for a pot sizing on the river unless they river a king. Uh, this next hand, he whacks me. He goes for a bet bet line. I call it an open ender and I check pot turn. Uh, he goes into the tank. He knows I probably just have 4 5 here. And he makes the call, so in my mind, I'm trying to dodge either a club or a board pair. On the turn, I decided I'm definitely folding clubs and probably folding a board pair. But then when I saw the pot odds, I convince myself to call which I think is still pretty bad because I think this, st uh, this spot is very under bluffed because the opponent also sees that I'm getting really good pot odds so they'll just assume I'll call off with four or five and um, considering I'm an unknown to Jane Andes in this spot I don't actually think he would go for a missed flush bluff here uh, so I think he'll just have it all the time. So yeah, this uh, second session was a lot longer than the first session, and we had some good hands in. Um, overall, he got me for, I think, 
two and a half buy-ins uh, since I started out with a quick double up with aces versus kings. Um, and then unfortunately the table ended up filling up again, so uh, we couldn't play heads up anymore, but we did actually play a bit longer, um, playing like seven, eight handed. And I mounted a bit of a comeback, but I'm not going to cover those because, uh, again, this is just primarily focusing on the heads up. So the next day, I had already planned to go to Win or Arya to play some live poker. I had just showered and I got dressed. And before I headed out, I looked at the lobby and noticed Jay Nandez looked kind of lonely and was sitting alone at the tables again. So once again, he's ruined my plans and I gotta go try to get him. Uh, this session was massive. It, we played heads up for three and a half hours and it's way too long to cover. I'll just cover a few hands here and there. But the gist is that I was up heaps on him. I think I won about three or four buy-ins in the first hour. And then since it's PLO, the tides turned immediately. And then he was up to 10k to my 2k about two hours in. And then in the third hour and a half, I mounted a comeback. And we were sitting on about 6,500 to his 4,900 when the session ended. So I booked like a one and a half buy and win ish, maybe. I wasn't really keeping much track. Um, but here's some highlight hands. First big pot we play, I just set over set him. It's a cooler and it's not that interesting, but it is worth noting that I should switch my strategy in the future to just hit and running him since I seem to always win the first big pots we play. Uh, a bit later, we play a pot where I finally get to see what he's 3-betting me with um, since I changed now to a min-raising strategy and he has the uh, 4, 5, 7, 8. Think post-flop, the hand played out pretty standard. I did take note that he was 3-betting me with these types of hands. Next hand, I min raise any three bets again. Flop, he bets. I call, checks turn, and river. I river nut flush, and I use a small bet. And I just want to note here that at this point in our match, Jay Nandez is very aware that I use a lot of weird river tiny sizings with a lot of strong hands and medium and weak hands. So uh, that sort of dynamic has been established. Uh, this next hand, I do a pretty standard check call two streets with nut flush draw and gutter and I lead river repping queen 10. And I think he makes a big fold here because over the course of our sessions, I haven't really shown many bluffs. So as the match goes on, if I feel like he's going to give me too much credit, then I'll start increasing my bluff frequency, which is pretty normal. This next hand, I slow play a set of threes till the river. I was mostly curious to see what his triple barrel frequencies were like and his sizings, but he checks the river, and though we river the nuts, I decide to go for a very small sizing here because uh, I can gain more information this way. If he has something like kings or jacks or king jack, uh, he'll never fold to this sizing. So the fact that he folded here probably shows me at least that he has probably like a king-queen-10 combo that he just gave up with, or jack-queen-ace-10, something like that. Uh, this next hand I included, I thought it was kind of funny. I limp double-suited aces, obviously a very strong hand, and I'm also obviously going for the limp re-raise, but he doesn't bite. Um, I go bet-bet, and we get to the river, and he leads, and I raise pretty large, and he calls with a pretty low flush draw. But it's very logical here because he shouldn't really expect me to limp that many suited aces. I think at this point he hasn't seen me limping hands this strong. Our timings and our showdowns have just not really matched up in that he would know that I'm limping strong hands for limp re-raises. So he probably puts me on the naked ace of spades on the river and hero calls, which I think is fine. But now he knows that I have strong hands in my limping range. So we're doing well, and of course, this is where it starts going all downhill. This next hand, I min-raise, he 3-bets, and I flop top 2. Um, he c-bets 3 fourths, and I call, 
And on the turn, he pots, and I feel like at this SPR, it's probably okay to just shove it in. So we go for it, and he's got a monster hand. Uh, we're technically ahead, but we're actually behind in equity, and we can't hold. And now it's his turn to ride the roller coaster up. Uh, this next hand, I range bet the flop after Jane Anda's 3-bet checked, as he should on this texture a decent amount. And on the turn, I turned the nut straight, but I felt like I didn't really need that much protection, so I went with a non-polar sizing and bet kind of small again. And then on the river, I got a little greedy and went for value, as I felt like he really didn't have much boats in his range, and the only boats he could possibly have, in my opinion, were something like 6-5 or... Four or five back doors, which actually he ended up having, so I guess I got a little too greedy there. Uh, the next hand, I finally get stacked for my first original buy in. I find a limp raise combo, and on a queen high flop, I c bet and he raises. And here, I just made a read that he probably just had combo diamonds and a straight draw, so I decide to peel and just stick it in on pretty blank turns. Unfortunately, the turn was a king of hearts, which brought in the straight, but it gave me a nut heart draw, so I just went with it, and he did end up having a 10-jack uh, combo draw, and we miss our hearts. Uh, next hand, I've changed my strategy once again to 2.5xing, but Jay Nandes is still 3-betting me with a bit higher frequency than usual. Uh, we flop a set and we take a bet bet line. Turns out Jane Nandes actually has a turned nut straight here and was just checking uh, as he probably would with his entire range and trying to get us to barrel off. But fortunately or unfortunately, River came six, which saved us money. Though I think we win a big pot if the board pairs on the river. <laughs> I do want to make a pretty significant note at this point that Jay Nandez, after 3-betting, will check the textures that are bad for a 3-betting range like this, and I think this will come into play for the next hand. The next hand, I 2.5x again and Jay Nandez 3-bets again, and it's another bad texture for him, so I fully expect him to check here, but to my surprise, he actually goes for a half-pot bet. On the turn, he follows up with a full pot, and now at this point, he's only repping 9-10. And given the way he's played the other 3-bet pots and these type of textures, I fully expect him to actually check uh, most of his range just because he knows I'll attack these textures a lot. So if he did have 9-10, I felt like he would just go for a check raise on the flop or check call, check raise turn. And so here I felt like there was a significant imbalance in his strategy and I just simply put him on 9-9 and decided to call down here. Uh, next hand might be a little interesting to some people because I think it demonstrates uh, some of the pros of using a tiny river bet. Um, Jane Andes raises pre I call, flop is all diamonds. Uh, he bets half and I call with top and bottom pair. Turn goes check check and river comes an ace and I make third nut boat. And on this river I decide to lead one tenth pot. Now when most people do these really tiny block bets on the river they're usually not nutted. But in this spot I think it's a good sizing to use because I think if Jay Nandis has a lot of ace x um, he'll put me on a flush a lot here and turn a lot of ace x into a bluff. Also, if he has queen-queen, there's no way he's not going to raise it here. And then if he also has a medium-high flush, I think he can find a raise as well. And I think if I went a large sizing, um, I don't think he would find as many raises as if I used a very small sizing. Plus, uh, just my own personal interpretation, I think using very tiny sizings in general is very annoying. And I like to tilt my opponents. Anyways, that's basically the gist of the third session and how I went from robusto to stuck to making a big comeback. At this point, across our three sessions, I think Jay Nandez and I have played a total of six hours together heads up, and despite my best efforts of implementing a super annoying miserable limb strategy that most opponents hate playing against, 
I gotta give him credit for sticking it out and battling three and a half hours. My main objective when it comes to heads up isn't to aggressively run over my opponents and win a bunch of money. Rather, I just want them to have the most unpleasant experience possible and have them go on life tilt by implementing a ton of limps, min raises, and tiny bet sizings in combination of being a bit of a nit. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. In the future, I should probably practice better game selection and not try to play all the PLO training site coaches is what I would like to say, except that I got baited into one more heads up session with Jane Nandez because he went live on YouTube streaming. So the next day, I was really itching to finally play a live session. I was already called in to the 5-5 and 1-2 PLO lists at Aria and Win. I play lower stakes live than online because, as everyone knows, uh, live players are just much better than online players because of uh, live tells and stuff, I guess. I showered, got dressed, and was playing a warm-up session online before I left when Jay Nandez shows up at my tables. I was pretty determined to just go play live, but then I noticed that he went live streaming on YouTube. So once again, my hands felt tied and I felt obligated to give him some action. And yet again, Jay Nandez ruins my live poker plans for the day. If you guys want to check out the game from Jay Nandez's perspective, you can go ahead and watch it on his YouTube channel. This video has been going on for way too long, so I'll just briefly cover maybe four hands, which I thought were pretty interesting. Unlike Phil Gelfond, I noticed that Jay Nandez doesn't really commentate much on the players while he's playing. I don't think he said a single thing about my game while he was live, despite us playing about 10 hours together uh, in the span of three days. I assume this is mostly to protect his strategy if he assumes his opponents will watch his videos and try to counter his reads and thought process, but unfortunately this makes for less interesting videos, as coming away from the stream, I still had no idea if he held the opinion of if I was a donkey or a fish. I'm gonna mark him as a non-pro for now. I guess I know where I stand. Anyways, we ended up playing four tables, and our only real heads up session was uh, 1020 deep table. Uh, let's just jump into some hands. I said earlier that I always seem to end up winning the first big pot that me and Nandis play, and in this session, it's no different. It's definitely a hand that could also four bet. I think we actually are gonna four bet this hand. In this hand, I three bet ace queen eight nine double suited, and he actually finds a four bet. Uh, I'm actually not convinced that this is a good four bet. Uh, for the reasons I stated earlier, I do have a tighter three betting range than the average heads up player. But we are also two hundred bigs deep, so I feel like that makes this maybe slightly better. Snapped off very, very bad flop. Actually, not even going to see bet this flop. On the flop, I check and Jay Nandez checks back, which makes perfect sense. Um, considering he 4 bet with a 6 9 7 in his hand, those are the cards he wants me to have. And he probably knows that I'm a pretty tight 3 better. So, a King Jack 2 Broadway board should actually hit me pretty hard. Um, when I see Jay Nandez check, I feel like that also makes a lot of sense, but I immediately eliminate hands like King Jack or Kings or Jacks. I don't think he'll slow play those in a 4-bet pot at this depth. I also think uh, he should be checking back some aces, like uh, let's say Ace, Ace, 7-5. Uh, because um, again, a 2-Broadway hand will hit me pretty hard, especially if he unblocks um, all those cards. Interesting turn, not, uh, not flush draw in a gutter. We'll take a free card in this turn, but obviously, as we do see a bet, we will just call. Going to the turn, I decide to fire at it. I feel like his flop check back is representing a pretty weak range. I think we both realize that I probably have the stronger range given these lines. So I felt like a stab here with some river bluffs would be a pretty decent line. But he does call. Uh, finally on the river, I river two pair and now my hand becomes a bluff catcher quality. 
unfortunate river card. I put him on a lot of missed hearts probably. And of course, sometimes ace 10 or 9 10. And when he bluffs the river for pot, he's only representing 9 10 and ace 10 because he certainly never has kings or jacks or rivered queens, in my opinion. I think it's way too thin to go for value with something like a check back ace king queen uh, top two pair. This hand is actually eerily similar to the first hand I played against Galfond when I made that video. Um, I had top two and I had king high flush draw and I had no straight blockers with all the straight blockers being ace, queen, and nine. And for those reasons, I ended up fooling the best hand when Phil bluffed with the ace and nine blocker in his hand. And in this video, uh, Nandes also has an ace and nine blocker in his hand and he bluffs. But for the exact same reasons I call, because now in this scenario, I unblock the hearts and I block an ace and a nine in my hand, which makes me feel like I have a mandatory bluff catch here. Uh, that's unfortunate. We get hero called. The very next hand is also a little interesting. I limped King Jack 4 8 and he raised. And on the flop, he bet uh, three quarters pot. And throughout our sessions, I felt like over time his C betting frequency was getting a little bit too high, especially for the sizing. So this hand is technically, I think, a pure call and it plays very well as a call. But I wanted to expand my flop raising range just to sort of punish what I felt was a. Uh, overstabbing frequency on the flop, so I decided to raise this hand. Jane Andes makes a, I think, slightly loose call uh, with ace, queen, queen, six, but I think it's probably fine because he does have nut backdoor clubs. And on the turn, when we turn a flush, I think we have a pretty easy check back here. We actually don't need that much protection against boat draws because I have the heavier set range than him, especially given that I block a jack. And also this all allows him to bluff some diamonds in his hands on the river if I take a weak turn line. And on the river, he goes for the bluff, which I think is pretty normal with the queen of diamonds. He must realize that his hand is probably not good here most of the time. And I have a pretty easy snap call here. Uh, I'm very under repped. And if I check back turn for pot control, it's a mandatory call with any flush on the river. Uh, this next hand's a bit silly. It's more of a street poker thing, I guess, if you want to call it that. Here my opponent check raises the flop and calls a flop 3 bet. Uh, it requires a little bit of history to explain what's going on, so I'll get into that. So across the three days, Jane Nandis does have a naturally high C bet frequency on paired static boards, like, you know, 447 or ace ace nine and over time when i noticed this my counter was to just check raise a lot and see how they reacted and then i think jay nandez started catching on to this so he started doing some bet three betting and then it just sort of becomes a circus from there so in this hand i go for the check raise with pocket kings actually um, which is probably fine to call, but again, we have a weird dynamic now on paired boards, and he goes for the bet 3-bet. And my read at the time was that I had actually just check-raised him twice on ace-ace pair boards, and so I felt like this time he might actually make a play at me, so I didn't think he had an ace. Um, I was technically right, but also wrong. And my plan going to the turn was just check fold if he bet again. But if the turn goes check check, I was going to lead river. And um, if I lead river though, it's actually for value with king. So I'd probably lead really small. The turn came a queen and then he bet again. And then I started to realize that, oh, he actually does have it here. He probably has like ace nine or an ace. And I decided to turn my hand into a bluff because I blocked the queen and having two kings in my hand is pretty relevant because it blocks him from having ace-king combos, which is the only hand that can outdraw ace-queen in this spot. The best he'll generally have is ace-nine and facing a min-raise, I felt like he would just read me for ace-queen because clearly I just always have it here. And so I felt like he would just have to fold all his boats and all his ace x. So I actually went for the min raise and he ended up snap folding here. 
which uh, once I saw it, I actually think it's fine. In fact, if I were him, I would always hold this spot too because like 90 something percent of the time, your opponent's just gonna have ace queen here. Check raises, turn me fold. Right, finally, the last hand I want to cover was actually a hand I was really curious about that I had to go back to stream to see what he had because I was pretty sure this was a fold, but I just wanted to confirm. Uh, in this spot, I limp queen nine eight seven. He raises and I call, and the flop comes five two nine. And here again, he goes for a three quarter c bet. And again, I'm expanding my check raising range, so I decide to check raise this hand with a nine blocker and a seven eight. Um, the 7-8 is actually kind of nice because if a 6 hits, you make a straight, but a 6 also brings in a 3-4 straight, which I don't really block, although I don't expect him to have that many 3-4s in his preflop isolating range. Uh, here we get check result. Interesting. Call. This is an interesting turn. So he calls here. We turn a queen uh, for top two, so we probably just have the best hand, and I fire another big bet. So he check raises the flop and bets turn. I'm quite tempted to just go for this thing. Uh, uh, I think we have the wrong hand, though, because I think we do want to block some sets. Or do we? I mean, a nine would be really good because then we could get pocket fives to fold in the turn, basically. River brings in backdoor diamonds and I check any pots, which I thought was pretty interesting because at first glance, I felt like I almost had a hero call here with the eight of diamonds. And if he flats my turn pot on the turn, he's going to have some sort of a strong draw usually. Um... I guess ace three four wraps makes sense. Uh, Ten jack king nine also makes a lot of sense. So the only bluffs he really has here are something like ten jack king. He's also going to have a lot of straights here on this river. Uh, none of them will actually pot uh, for value since the flush got there, with the exception of the ace of diamonds straights. And then um, as far as naked ace of diamonds, he's likely not going to have a naked ace of diamonds if he's isolating blind versus blind with an ace 3-4 type hand. And if he does have something like that, he's probably actually not going to turn the naked ace of diamonds into a bluff uh, if he made a straight either. So I went into the tank for a really long time this hand and I time ended up folding for those reasons. I personally think Jamandis should have gone for a maximum tiers sort of line and gone for like a 20 or 30% pot paid, bet. But I know the solver is probably just like pots here. So I guess that's just a difference in style. We can't. Unfortunate. Unfortunate. Thanks for watching, guys. Lee. Hope you guys liked the video. And maybe I'll see you guys again if I come across another PLO coach on the streets of WSOP.com.